free fall, distance as a function of time. So if we know how far this person has fallen, we can calculate how much time it's going to take for them to hit the water. Well, big deal, you say. Well, but remember, if we know how much time it takes to hit the water, we can calculate how fast they'll be traveling when they hit the water. So with your calculation, you might want to rethink that belly flop. So what we learned last time was that when an object accelerates uniformly, we know how fast it's going to be traveling at any moment in time. And that is given by this equation here. The instantaneous velocity in the x-direction is your initial velocity in the x-direction plus your acceleration in the x-direction times time. And this is an instantaneous velocity. It is the velocity you have at this instant. But now what we want to do is we want like to be able to calculate how far an object has traveled at any instant in time. We want to know distance as a function of time. Well, we kind of already know that. If we just rearrange this equation, if we knew the velocity and the time, we can calculate the change in position. Or change in position is the final position minus the initial position and how much time has elapsed. Solving this piece of the equation with this, we would get x sub f here. I'm leaving the final position off. I'm just leaving, talking about in terms of an instantaneous position and against the position at this instant in time. Just average velocity times time. So it's your standard problem. If you're traveling and you went 50 meters per second for three seconds, you traveled 150 meters. That's kind of straightforward. But now we need to look at it, but what happens when we are accelerating? So we start out at this initial velocity and we smoothly and uniformly accelerate up to this velocity. Because this is a straight line, the average velocity is just going to be halfway between those two numbers. And it's just the average velocity is calculating the average like we've always calculated average. Add two numbers, divide by two. This equation works for this situation. It does not work for a situation where the acceleration is not uniform. This, in this example, it's increasing acceleration. So maybe the light turned green. We press on the gas pedal very lightly. So we begin going faster and faster but the acceleration is very little. And then we start to press harder and harder on the gas pedal, so we go faster and faster. And then right in through here, we really munch on the gas pedal, so we just really begin to accelerate. But um, because we had such a low velocity for a long period of time, the average velocity would be much closer to the initial velocity. It's not gonna be halfway in the middle like it was here. But straightforward question, what was your average velocity if you accelerate uniformly from 20 meters per second to 30 meters per second? It's just the average of 20 and 30. You add 20 and 30, you get 50, divide by 2, 25 meters per second. So this is the equation how we typically see it, and we talk about our initial velocity. But if we're traveling at a constant velocity, Whatever our velocity was initially, if it stayed that, then our initial velocity will be the same thing as our average velocity. So we can, like we did just a moment ago, calculate our average velocity this way. So we can calculate how far we traveled with an average velocity like this, or when we are accelerating, we have to calculate the average um, velocity like this. Again, this equation only works when it's uniform acceleration, when velocity and time is a straight line graph. So we have our speedometer and we have our graph and we drop an object. We know that every second gravity is going to increase its velocity by 10 meters per second. And it is a smooth straight line. That is what gravity is doing. But let's look what gravity is not doing. Gravity does not make the thing accelerate like this. Dink, 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 dink. 
Gravity doesn't instantaneously shoot up the velocity by 10 meters per second and then maintain that velocity for any period of time. It's not the stair step thing, it's a smooth thing. Now let's zoom in on that here. So yeah, we get it that it doesn't instantaneously shoot up and then maintain that, but often students will use their equations as if this blue stair step is what's actually going on. It's not. It's this red line smoothly and uniformly. So one question I might add, we're going to focus in on just this one second here, the very first second. But one question I had is, was there ever a moment in, in all this time that it was traveling 10 meters per second? And yes, right here at one second, it was traveling 10 meters per second. Well, the next question would be for what length of time was it traveling 10 meters per second? And the answer is no time at all. It was an only traveling 10 meters per second for an instant. A moment earlier, it was traveling a little slower. A moment later, it was traveling a little faster. But I'd like to calculate how far an object will fall in that first second. So distance, initial position, we'll say the initial position was zero, average velocity times time. So we take 10 times one and we get 10 meters. And that is not correct because that would be saying that the average velocity was the same thing as the instantaneous velocity. It, it was not going 10 meters per second the entire time. It started out at zero, smoothly went up to 10 meters per second. So we have to calculate the average velocity during that one second. And if it started out at zero and ended up going 10 meters per second, its average velocity was five meters, uh, meters per second. So it's gonna go five meters. So just be careful. After one second, its velocity, its instantaneous velocity is gonna be 10 meters per second. But the distance that it fell in that one second would only be five meters. So let's pretend we're in the car, lights red. Now the light turns green and we begin to accelerate. Let's see if we can remember how to calculate acceleration. I'll do this for 10 seconds. Maybe you can estimate it already. But once it stops, we can see that it changed its velocity by 30 meters per second in the 10 seconds. That's three meters per second per second. But now the question is, how far did the car travel during the 10 seconds? Well, you would be tempted to say 30 times 10 and it went 300 meters. But we have to be careful here. The average velocity that it's initial velocity was zero, its final velocity was 30, it only averaged 50 meters per, 15 meters per second for the 10 seconds. So it would have traveled 150 meters down the road. We are saying that the initial position was zero. That's like we were at the origin, which might be the, uh, the white line or the crosswalk. But if we had like a different problem where there was a big semi truck in front of us and we started 20 meters behind the crosswalk and then we accelerated that rate, we would have only been 130 meters forward of the crosswalk after 10 seconds. We'll do that one more time. So let's see if you can estimate the acceleration as the uh, speedometer is going. We're only doing it for five seconds this time, but four meters per second squared would be the acceleration. How far did we travel in the five seconds? We weren't traveling that speed the entire time. We only averaged 10. So if we average 10 for five seconds, 10 meters per second for five seconds, we'll be 50 meters down the road. I'm gonna take a little bit of time and uh, fill in the details of this data table here. And I want to acknowledge that I'm, I'm using positive 10 for the acceleration of gravity. Uh, if we drop a ball, the velocity is going to be down. All the velocity should be negative and the acceleration is negative. 
but I think just for simplicity, I'm just making all my numbers positive. So what will be our instantaneous velocity at one second? Well, it'll be 10 meters per second. At two, we're gonna increase by another 10, and 30, and 40, and 50. Every second that went by, we're going to increase by 10 meters per second. Now what I want to do is talk about what distance we traveled during each second. Not all together, that's what we're going to do here. But just during the first second, between time equals zero and time equals one second. What distance would we travel? Well, it's our average velocity between zero and 10 our average velocity was five meters per second. So if we average five meters per second for that one second, we'll go five meters. And because that's the only distance we traveled, that's the total distance we've traveled. Let's do it again. And again, this is just during the second second of time between when the stopwatch read one to the moment the stopwatch read two. The average velocity is 15 meters per second. So if we average 15 meters per second for one second, we'll go 15 meters. Plus the five that we traveled during the first second, 20 meters altogether. So we, we, can, we see a pattern here, but the average velocity is 25 meters per second. If we do that for one second, we'll travel 25 meters plus the distance we traveled during the first two seconds, 45 altogether. Average of 45, I'm sorry, 35. You saw that before I did. We traveled 35 meters during the fourth second, plus the 45 we already traveled, 80 altogether. During the fifth second, we averaged 45 meters per second. For that one second, we traveled 45 meters, plus the 80 we already traveled, 125 altogether. So we had to do a lot of steps to come up with this number here. Uh, let's see if we can just come up with that number a different way. Instead of finding the distance we traveled during each second, let's do it for all five seconds. Well, what was our average velocity for all five seconds? We started at zero and we ended up going 50 we averaged 25 meters per second for the five seconds, and 25 times five is 125. All right, let's use that chart now to make sense of, uh, first of all, we're just gonna drop a ball, let it fall for one second that fast, and two seconds, and three seconds, and four seconds. We can see that the velocity changes by 10 every second, 10 meters per second every second. But using that chart, in one second, it falls five meters. In two seconds, 20, three, 45, and four seconds, it's gonna fall 80 meters. Instead of calling this time zero, let's call down here time zero. And then now we're gonna throw the ball up at 40 meters per second. It's gonna slow down, slow down, slow down, take four seconds to get to the top another four seconds to get back to the bottom. So if we throw the ball up at 40 meters per second, how long will it be in the air? Well, if it was going 40 meters per second, it's gonna take one second before it has gone to 30, another second, another second, another second, four seconds to go up, another four seconds to come down, eight seconds of time in the air altogether we would say the hang time was eight seconds. Now the question is, how high did it go? Well, how high up it went is the same distance as how far it fell. So if it was in the air for eight seconds, it was only falling for four seconds. So in four seconds of free fall, it's gonna fall 80 meters. We'll do the problem again. If a ball is thrown so that it is in the air for six seconds, well, that's three up and three down. How fast did we throw it? Well, if we threw it at 30 meters per second, it's gonna take one second before it's going 20 meters per second, 
another second before 10, and that third second, it will be stopped. Another three seconds to come back to the ground. It will be in the air for six seconds, and we must have thrown it at 30 meters per second. Now the question is, how high did it go? Well, if it was falling, if, if it was in the air for six seconds, it was only falling for three, so it must have fallen 45 meters. And the distance that it falls is the same distance that it went up, how high it went. To fill in the details of that chart, we used this equation. We found the average velocity. And we use this equation, that if it averaged a velocity for one second, we could figure out the distance that it traveled. And then we use this equation to, came up with, to come up with the velocities initially anyway, the first column we filled in. Well, since we used all three of those equations to fill in that table, maybe we could substitute all those equations into each other and come up with one equation. So what we're gonna do, average velocity is calculated this way, but here's average velocity. So let's substitute this in for average velocity. Instantaneous final velocity is calculated this way. So let's substitute that in for instantaneous final velocity. Now we have a V sub naught and a V sub naught. We can combine like terms and get two V sub naught. And then we still have acceleration times time. Time is being, time is being multiplied by every term here and every term there is also being divided by two. So I'm gonna distribute time into here and here. I'm gonna divide this by two and I'm gonna divide that by two. And that's what we get when we do all that. In the last video I talked about, and even in this one, we, we looked at this portion of our kinematic equation. Our instantaneous velocity was our, sorry, our initial, our instantaneous position was our initial position plus the, the distance we traveled due to our velocity. But now we've added this term into it. This would be the distance we travel due to our accelerating. So that's a big equation we're gonna use and that will work for any uniform acceleration. That, and the X's here indicate the direction. If I were to, do that not in the horizontal direction, but in the vertical direction, I would substitute y's in for there because it's the y direction. And instead of saying the acceleration in the y direction, I'm just gonna say it's gravity. Remember that the acceleration of gravity is a negative 9.8 meters per second squared, or if we do it in feet per second squared, it's negative 32.2 feet per second squared. Let's just look at the units of this equation to show you that it really does everything works out nicely. Well, this initial position is just gonna be measured in meters. This term is velocity and time, meters per second times seconds. Seconds cancel and we just get meters. This is the distance we traveled due to our velocity. This is acceleration times time squared uh, the one half is not a unit. We're just looking at units. So meters per second squared is acceleration times time, but it got squared. So seconds squared canceled, and we're just left with meters. So this is adding on the distance that we traveled due to our acceleration. Now we had to do a lot of work to come up with uh, particularly these numbers here but let's just show you how that equation will work to come up with these numbers. I'm keeping it simple by saying the initial position was zero and the initial velocity was also zero. So both of those terms will cancel out. And I'm just left with this equation here. So the acceleration is 10. So one half of 10 is five times one second squared. Five times one is five. 5 times 4 is 20, 5 times 9, 45, 5 times 16 is 80, and 5 times 25 is 125. It looks like we can come up with these numbers here 
uh, using just this portion of our equation. Now I do like poking fun at Hollywood uh, and students often tell me don't mess with Pocahontas here but um, let's show you this little video clip and see if what she did was reasonable. So I'm not sure she was just showing off, but let's uh, see how reasonable that jump was. We've got this equation here we've developed and we hopefully understand. The time was nine seconds and I do want an answer in feet here. So this time I'm gonna use the acceleration of gravity in feet per second squared. So when we take nine squared times that and all that together, we get a negative 1,304 feet. That means she dropped that distance there. To give you an idea, that is about 100 feet taller than the World Trade Centers were. That is a mighty big jump. And remember that we have this kinematic equation that would calculate our instantaneous velocity. So we'll say that she was not moving up or down initially, so that every second each of the nine seconds, she will change her velocity by this amount, which is going to be, she will be traveling in the downward direction at 290 feet per second when she hit the water. Now, I don't know if that seems like it's fast or not, but let's convert those units using dimensional analysis. One mile is the same thing as 5,280 feet feet on the top and feet on the bottom cancel. And then let's go ahead and cancel seconds. There are 3,600 seconds in one hour. Seconds on the bottom, seconds on the top, cancel. My unit becomes miles per hour. And that's the number that my calculator would give. I haven't uh, mentioned significant figures very much, but uh, this number here had two sig figs. This number here had three sig figs. We should have left two sig figs on our answer. So we would round up to 200, but we needed to show that it had two sig figs. We would have to put that into scientific notation. 2.0 times 10 to the 100 would be 200, but that 2.0 shows that it had two sig figs. One last problem before I finish here. But this is the Royal Gorge Bridge, and it's 955 feet off the water. This is the Arkansas River down here. And we would like to figure out how much time it would take for an object to fall from that height, but we're going to throw it up at 20 feet per second first. So it's going to go up for a little while, stop, turn around, and then fall past that. And uh, this is the kinematic equation we're developing or we've, we're using now. Let me explain these two here real quick. Its initial position is going to be way up here, and we want to figure out when its position is way down here, which we will call the origin, zero. We start at 955 meters above the origin. So the y position is going to be zero when it hits, and it started that high up. The initial velocity was 20 feet per second up, so it's positive. Gravity is going to be negative 32.2 feet per second squared, and gravity is down. We really do have to keep track of our positives and negatives here. So we have half of negative 32.1, we get negative 16.1. And we look at that and think, oh dear, we got a time squared and a time? That's a quadratic equation. We, we have to solve that using the quadratic formula. Well, I'm going to spare you the details. You could just identify this as A, this as B, and this is C, and plug the numbers into a quadratic formula calculator, and that's what I did actually. But when you do that, you get a, plus, a positive answer and you get a negative answer. Um, we're not really interested in what happened before we threw it. That'd be negative time. We want to figure out what happened 8.7 seconds after we threw it.
positive time. So this is the answer that we're going to get for that. It's going to take 8.7 seconds to go up and then fall all the way down here. If we were to instead throw the object down at, 100, at 200 feet per second, just shoot, throw it straight down, it's going to be the same equation, the same numbers. The only thing that is different is that the initial velocity was in the down direction at 20 feet per second. Plugging those numbers into the quadratic formula, we get these two answers. And again, we're not interested what happened before we threw it, but it looks like it's going to hit the water. Its position is going to be zero uh, 6.8 seconds after we threw it straight down. Okay, we did a lot today, and that is the equation that we developed. We now have that in our tool bag, and it does open up a lot of uh, interesting problems for us to do.